Well, we begin with late breaking news near the medical center. San Antonio police responding to a call for an active shooter around 10 this morning. SAPD discovered the call was a hoax and that there is no active shooter at a building in the 7400 block of John Smith Drive. Police just finished giving a press conference and Jonathan Cotto is there with more. Jonathan. That's right, Tiffany. It's important to mention that this situation has been called a hoax by San Antonio Police Department, who say they responded within four minutes of getting that call. Now, right now, I'm located in the parking lot of Galen College of Nursing. This is a multi-story building where nursing students were evacuated immediately, nursing students and staff. And of course, there's other offices located within this building. Now, police tell us that at any given time, this building can hold up to 12,000 people. Now, I had an opportunity to speak with uh, one of the evacuees who say he was very proud in the response time from SAPD and very proud on how well organized everyone inside this building was able to safely make it out. Now, it's important to note that San Antonio police are investigating the origin of that call and they will be looking into that matter. Another thing they said is that these types of situations will not be taken lightly. He noted that seven other hoax calls have played out throughout the state of Texas, all seven being in investigated. Reporting live outside of Galen College of Nursing at Medical Center, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Of course, Jonathan will have much more on KSAT.com and of course, KSAT 12 News at 5 o'clock this afternoon. Also new at noon, a two-year-old child back with her father after police say she was abandoned by her mother. According to the affidavit on her arrest, Madison Baltzell Pig is suspected of giving away her two-year-old child to an unknown person they had no family connection to her or her father. Now, the father reported his daughter missing last month since he hadn't seen her or Baltzell for some time. When questioned by police, Baltzell says she boarded a bus in Missouri with her daughter to give her child up to a woman named Kendra. During the police interview, the child's father received a call from a woman who claimed she was caring for his daughter for almost a year. She then turned, returned the child back to her father's home and claimed she hadn't spoken to Baltzell in five months. San Antonio police are looking for two shooters who left a man dead in his own backyard. This happening late last night near Wyoming and Pine Streets. According to police, the victim had an argument with two other men. That led to what may have been an exchange of gunfire, and the victim was hit several times. Police are still looking for the shooters. Two men last seen driving off in a dark-colored SUV. A man wanted by San Antonio police on multiple felony warrants is in the hospital this morning after he was hit by a driver on Highway 90 near Couples Road last night. Police say they were actively searching for the suspect and spotted him walking on the access road. After noticing police, the man ran up the ramp onto the highway and was hit by a driver. He was taken to a hospital. His condition is unknown. A man in the hospital after he was hit while driving his motorcycle on the west side. San Antonio police say a man in his 30s was riding his motorcycle just after 1030 last night. He was going northbound on West Avenue near La Manda, and that's when a driver in a sedan turned and then hit the man riding the motorcycle. That man was taken to the hospital, expected to be OK. There are no charges filed at this time. San Antonio police and Crime Stoppers are asking for your help finding those responsible for beating a man unconscious outside a bar. This happened in September of last year outside of Doc Brown's bar on West Loop 1604. Officers say the 26-year-old victim was leaving the bar when a group of men got into a fight. He tried to stop the fight and was attacked by multiple people. Officers say the suspects drove off in a red F-150 truck and a silver Hyundai Elantra. If you know anything, call S. 210-224-STOP. Two cats dead, a family without a home after it went up in flames on the west side. According to the San Antonio Fire Department, the fire happened just after 9 o'clock last night in the 1600 block of Melissa Sioux. Firefighters say the family who lived at that home had been gone since noon, but when they returned, they found it covered in smoke. Fire officials say they also tried to rescue their two cats, but were unsuccessful. They then notified SAFD and when crews arrived, they found flames coming from the home. The cause still unknown right now. Safety in our schools. It's something that's been on the minds of a lot of parents recently. That's why San Antonio's largest school district, NISD, held a school safety symposium at Brennan High School last night. The goal was to give parents a chance to ask questions about the district's plans to keep their kids safe. This also comes after the campus has been in the headlines recently for several incidents, including weapons and THC vape pens found on school grounds. 
We also knew that this was a great location and a great community to start with. This is an amazing campus, and we want to make sure that we get out in front of any of the concerns that parents might have, give them an option to come in to learn about these topics. School officials say they plan to extend these types of learning opportunities throughout the entire district. And in case you missed it, the Texas Historical Commission voted to approve permits that would remove 48 trees from Breckenridge Park and relocate 19 others. It's all part of a bond project. Opponents of the project were hoping the state commission would force the city to change course. However, the trees are being removed due to their proximity to walls and other cultural resources. A date has not been set for when those trees will be taken down. Now to the latest in that horrific mass shooting in a Kentucky bank. Authorities releasing the 911 tapes from the attack, including a call from the suspect's mother. ABC's Trevor Alt has the details, and we do want to warn you that some of what you're about to see and hear could be very disturbing. Amazing grace. Overnight, oh. hundreds gathering to honor and mourn the five lives taken in Monday's horrific Louisville Bank shooting. Among the speakers, Old the National Bank lives, CEO Jim Ryan, remembering his employees Tommy Elliott, Juliana Farmer, Jim Tutt, Dina Eckert, and Josh Barrick. Make no mistake. These were extraordinary people. The vigil coming as newly released 911 calls shed light on the horror they endured, including one call from the gunman's mother who was trying to warn police about her son. My son might be having to have a gun and he's heading toward the Old National at uh, the Main Street here in Louisville. Main Street, Old National? Yes, and I, this is his mother. I'm so sorry. I'm getting details secondhand. I'm running to it now. Oh, my Lord. She said her son's roommate said he'd left a note and likely had a gun. I, I don't know what to do. I need your help. I, I think he, he's never hurt me once. He's a really good kid. Please don't come up to him. Please, he, he's not violent. Mm -hmm. He's never done anything. Please, please. Okay, and you don't believe he owns guns? I know he doesn't own any guns. But officials say six days prior, 25-year-old Connor Sturgeon purchased an AR-15. By that point of the call, he'd already opened fire inside the crowded conference room where he worked. And that shooter's mother actually wanted to come down here to the bank to try to stop her son. But the 911 operator had to tell her they had already received other emergency calls here, and it was too late. Trevor Alt, ABC News, Louisville, Kentucky. Still ahead, food prices dipping for the first time in over two years. We'll tell you by how much in a few minutes. Plus, how the severe flooding happening right now in Florida is affecting flights in and out of Fort Lauderdale. But first, how a new book is showcasing the history of Jefferson High School's Lasso's Rope and Dance Team. Welcome back. A new book is capturing the rich history of the unique service, spirit, and performance of Jefferson High School's Lasso's Rope and Dance Team. I spoke with former Lasso's who share their favorite memories and what this book means to them. Lasso's was my sport. Once a lasso, always a lasso. That's what Joe Beth Kirkpatrick lives by. We got to go places and perform for all different kinds of groups. Joe Beth is a former Jefferson High School lasso and is now featured in the newest book that shares the history of the team, titled The Lasso Legacy Then and Now, More Than Roping. Joe Beth is still connected with this team in many ways. She spends time teaching the next generation of lassos. Joe Beth says teamwork is key. You learned how to depend on each other and back each other up. Those involved in this book are passionate about this sport. We interviewed a lot of people and there's just some amazing stories uh, in the book. And you know, the lasso has, the lassos have a long history. The organization is over 91 years old. We think researchers will use it who are doing uh, historical stories or research about the city. This is gonna be a good uh, tool for them. The book will be sold at their Fiesta Social tonight at Los Barrios Mexican Restaurant from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. The legacy continues in San Antonio. You know, the lassos are part of our city. That's, that's some talent right there. Right, and you said you're, you're going to practice. Uh, I'm, I'm working on it so I can go out there and uh, see if we can hang with the, the ladies out there in their lassos. It's think? a lot of hard work, so. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not easy. I no. mean, your arm gets tired. They, they did that through your whole life shot earlier, and your arm never got tired. No. 
They're incredible. That I got to see, David. Okay, <laughs> see that happen. Mark that down. Well, incredible book right there. Well, uh, the aquifer is down four tenths of a foot to 637.1. In your pollen count, everything's coming down. This is great news. Oak is in the moderate category, but it's down to 160. That's a drop from yesterday. Molds are low. Pecan is low. We've got a cold front headed our way this weekend. What does it mean for the forecast? We'll talk about it. coming up. The cost of putting food on the table is down. Grocery prices fell in March, which is the first decline since September 2020, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The data shows indexes for eggs, poultry and fish fell 1.4 percent from February to March. Fruits and vegetables prices also dipped slightly in that time frame. Bakery items, cereals and non-alcoholic drinks were among the products that did become more expensive. The Pentagon now limiting who gets access to its daily intelligence briefs. The move comes after a major leak of classified information was discovered last week. It's all part of the Pentagon Joint Staff's whittling down of its distribution list. One official said everyone on the list had proper clearance, but not everyone needs to receive that information daily. Sources say the leaked documents were likely printed mostly from briefing books that staffers assemble for senior officials on the Pentagon Joint Staff. In Florida, severe flash flooding is being seen across multiple parts of the state and more rain is on the way. Several days of nonstop rain in South Florida, transforming roadways into rivers. And yesterday, some areas saw more than a foot of rainfall in just 24 hours. The Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport had to close because the surrounding roads were flooded. And it could be a while before things start to dry out. The Weather Prediction Center says strong to severe storms in Texas could be heading eastward today and tomorrow. Of course, we kind of missed out on those strong, severe storms down here that are headed east, unless there was <laughs> last week's, but I don't think so. Well, it's, it's a storm system that's east of Texas right now that has been bringing in some of that rain, but th those uh, incredible photos and pictures coming out of Fort Lauderdale there, especially the airport, just see that much water. Uh, there is a little bit more on the way today, and we'll show you that here in just a second. First, couple big announcements today. First, We've got the hurricane prediction coming in from Colorado State. We do this every season. It's a look ahead to hurricane season, which of course starts June 1st. Here's what they're thinking. 13 named storms, six hurricanes, two major hurricanes. You compare that to the average, it's actually a little bit below. For the first time in a long time, they are predicting a slightly below average season. Why is that? Because of El Nino. Uh, there was an El Nino watch actually issued today. That's the other announcement from NOAA with the idea that they believe that uh, El Nino will kick in this summer. And typically once you see an El Nino, it tends to bring Atlantic hurricane season down a little bit, at least the numbers. And then it also tends to bring rain chances up here across South Texas, generally speaking. So it's good news, I think. Uh, we'll have to wait uh, until we get into the summer to see the, the effects. But it's looking better, folks. I think we're going to climb out of this drought uh, at some point here over the next uh, hopefully year. 71 right now. We've got partly cloudy skies or mostly sunny skies. Dew point is at 57. In the south southwesterly breeze at about 7 miles per hour. Just a couple clouds here at the moment. Uh, you can see those clouds off in the distance and uh, cumulus clouds popping up here and there, but nothing that's uh, of great significance. Certainly no rain today. We're going to see a lot of sun and a lot of blue sky. 73 in Kerrville, 70 in New Braunfels, 79 in Carrizo Springs, 79 in Catua, 74 in Kennedy, and around Bear County. We're in the low to mid 70s right now. Really comfortable. It was a great morning. It's going to lead into a great afternoon. Here's a case at 12 hour forecast 80 at 3 o'clock. 81 is our high temperature today and we fall back down into the 70s tonight. What you'll start to notice as we head into tonight is additional humidity. It starts to pour in and it gets a little sticky by tomorrow morning. Right now, dew points are right there on the edge. We're in the upper 50s. That's still technically in the pleasant category. But once we start to jump into the 60s, that's when you start to feel it a little bit more. And that will certainly be the case by tomorrow. Dew points very quickly jump up into the 60s and even 70s early on Saturday before dry air comes in again and uh, it becomes far more comfortable again uh, by late Saturday and into Sunday. Here's the situation and there's that low pressure system that has been bringing all the rain to Florida. There is a tornado watch box across parts of Georgia and there's heavy rain still uh, across parts of North Florida. This is going to lift off to the north and east and move away. And that system will 
uh, get out of here. But uh, again, tornado watch box. So there's going to be some strong storms, I think, across parts of Georgia this afternoon. For us, we're just going to watch for a few clouds working in. And then as we get into tomorrow morning, clouds develop. It's cloudy first half of the day and then partly cloudy during the afternoon. There's a very, very small chance of a storm popping up out west tomorrow. Otherwise, as we get into Saturday, we'll have a dry line and cold front in play. There's a small chance we can see a couple storms, I think, east of San Antonio Saturday uh, afternoon, Saturday evening. Uh, but the, the chance is small. For the most part, it's just going to be warm. Then our front comes through, clears us out, and we get some breezy winds on Saturday. The risk of severe weather is going to be generally off to our north and east and away from us. So we're not too worried about uh, Severe weather there again. There is a small chance here Saturday warm 92, but 79 Sunday and breezy uh, 79 Sunday 80 Monday 81 Tuesday and we'll get uh, into the low 80s on Wednesday with some small rain chances there Tuesday and Wednesday guys summer vibes today. That's what it's giving. It's feeling that way. Yeah, <laughs> thanks Justin coming up in sports. What needs to happen in order for the Brahmas to make the XFL playoffs? And also coming up, we're going to hear from Marcus Davenport about that new big contract he just signed with the Minnesota Vikings. Hey, talk about hitting it big. Former New Orleans Saint defensive end Marcus Davenport talking about his big move for some big money. He signed a one-year contract with the Minnesota Vikings. According to reports, he'll make $10 million in salary and he'll have a chance to make another $3 million based on off-season workouts and per-game roster bonuses. The Stevens High School alum and UTSA great was asked, how does it feel? That he'll, and how will he fit in with the linebackers there in Minnesota? Honestly, I, I don't know how I'm going to fit yet. But, you know, just looking at great players and seeing them, having seen them throughout the years, um, being drafted and, you know, having comparisons. I know they're great players. And from that aspect, you know, I just want to come in and be able to help and contribute and be a great player in my own right and, you know, help us all out. I think um, together, you know, just in general, I think we can all be a force. Davenport added that he just wants to start from zero and that he wants to dominate. In the XFL, the 2-6 and six San Antonio Brahmas are getting ready to host the 1-7 and seven Orlando Guardians. San Antonio lost 17-15 to the Houston Roughnecks, the Alamo Dome on Easter Sunday. With two regular season games left, the Brahmas are facing elimination for the XFL playoffs. The Brahmas need to win their final two games and hope the Arlington Renegades lose their final two. Man, there's still a chance, you know, to uh, obviously get in the playoff, man. You know, we need a little help, but that's still an opportunity. So we're going to keep fighting and playing hard, man, until they tell us we have no no, no chance. You know what I'm saying? So um, it's about pride, man. It's about, you know, uh, something bigger than yourself, man. Every time you play football, you want to put your best your best effort on tape. You know what I'm saying? Especially in a league like this, you know, it's an opportunity to, to get yourself, you know, uh, a chance to go to, to the NFL. All right, so the Brahmas are going to host the Guardians Saturday, 6 o'clock in the Alamo Dome. And once again, the Brahmas facing a must-win situation. World Series champion Houston Astros closed out their three-game series at the Pittsburgh Pirates yesterday. Afternoon game, top of the fourth. Astros lead 1-0. Corey Jolks hammers that ball to left field for his first Major League homer. Astros up 2 nothing, And then the guy grabbed it in the stands. That was a, you know, good grab in the stands, and he just tosses it back on the field because it wasn't his guy. Bottom of the six, Jokes showed off his defensive skills. How about that sliding grab? Alex Bregman added a three-run shot in the seventh. The Astros take it 7 nothing, get their first series win of the season. Texas Rangers shortstop Corey Seager will be out four to six weeks after he suffered a grade two hamstring strain. It happened during the fifth inning. As he was pulling up in the second, you can see it right there. You know, he's in some serious pain. He was off to a great start this year, too. Led the Rangers with a 359 batting average, also seventh best in the AL. Josh Smith will now see a lot of time at shortstop. And the Royals won at 10-1. Texas will next play at Houston on Friday night. There is that final. And it was military appreciation night at the Wolf. The mission is hosting the Rough Riders. Top one, first go looking to score. And there is a rip to Louis Avigus Jr. He makes a diving stop, throws the second for an out, and Connor Hollis throws the home. Oh, we got him in the old-fashioned pickle. Yeah, that didn't last long, did it? Man, got him in the rundown and 
took care of that real fast. He was tagged out with no problem. And then there's the long ball from the Rough Riders. They went at 7-1 over the San Antonio Missions. I want to go to a San Antonio Missions game. You it's, should. It's so fun. I, I've been there like a few years back, but I think it's time. The perfect weather yes. for baseball. Right? It's great stuff. Yep. All right. We'll be right back. And coming up in our next half hour, did you start your own business last year? We have some things you may want to keep in mind when filing your tax. And maybe elections are under a month away. We are breaking down Proposition A and what changes it could bring to our city if it is passed. And yesterday they had grilled cheese sandwiches. Wow, I wonder what they got today. You know Mike's got something in store for us. All Look right. at that. Some nice Fiesta decorations they got going on down there. They're in the spirit. We're excited. The focus on the May elections is coming up in just a second. But first, we're going to talk about the beautiful. Hopefully, it'll be like this on the day we have the May elections. Oh, yeah. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, these blue skies are fantastic. It's been a great stretch. Uh, we've had really cool mornings and nice afternoons. Nothing to complain about. And take a look at this picture and just soak it in. It's uh, so nice. Uh, Garner State Park. That's the sunset at the Frio River. Boy, what I wouldn't do to be there right now. That sounds nice. Uh, beautiful shot. We appreciate it. As always, you can send those pictures into our KSAT Connect via the KSAT Weather app or the KSAT app. Very serene. And as we look at uh, visibility and the satellite, we had some fog earlier. That's obviously gone. Uh, in fact, we've lost all cloud cover here. So it is uh, mostly sunny, and that's what we're going to be dealing with most of today. 79 at 2 o'clock, 83 p.m., 81, 4 o'clock. And that's our high 79 at 6 p.m. 78 7 p.m. and down to 76 at 8 p.m. Now as we get into tonight you're going to start to see clouds increasing so too will the dew point and the moisture so by tomorrow morning we'll start off with clouds maybe some fog too something we'll be tracking and then a cold front comes in on Saturday and brings some changes we'll talk more about what that means for your weekend forecast plus the drop monitor we got to show you that too after last week's rain that's coming up in just a couple minutes guys. Thank you, Justin. Now let's talk about the focus on the May elections because they're starting to get a little sharper as those elections get closer. The mayor's office and all 10 city council seats are on the May 6th ballot, but it is Proposition A that's expected to be the real draw for San Antonio voters. The proposed change to the city charter covers marijuana, abortion, chokeholds, and site and release. Garrett Berger takes us through it all. Would you like to sign a petition to get the decriminalization of marijuana on the ballot so people aren't arrested for possessing low-level amounts? Oh, yeah. More than 20,000 verified signatures got the so-called San Antonio Justice Charter onto the May ballot as Proposition A. At first, the push was largely dominated by talk of decriminalizing marijuana. Prop A would attempt to prevent arrests or citations in most cases for possessing less than four ounces of pot and would keep police from using its smell as probable cause for a search. Six other Texas cities have passed similar initiatives, but... They've split on whether or not they've actually followed through. Prop A also appears to be the first attempt in the state to decriminalize abortion with a local ballot initiative. It would largely prohibit police from investigating abortion crimes and forbid the city from gathering information on any abortions or passing that info on to other government agencies, apart from what's required in state or federal law. One of the most controversial parts of the proposition is the expansion of site and release. The city already has a program that allows officers to cite people for certain misdemeanors instead of arresting them. They'd still face a charge, but the DA's office then decides whether to let the cited person into a diversion program that could keep the offense off their record. Although prosecutors can also decide to charge them as normal through the court system. The SAPD's cite and release program includes most of the things allowed under state law, except graffiti and thefts from individuals. So pot possession, vandalism worth up to 750 bucks, or theft from a store for the same amount already might not result in an arrest. But officers now have some discretion whether to cite or arrest someone, whereas Prop A would require they cite people in most cases. That includes for graffiti. The mandate also extends to Class C misdemeanors except public intoxication. Those are the lowest level crimes that officers already typically just issue citations for. Prop A also tackles some other existing issues. SAPD policy bans chokeholds and no-knock warrants, but supporters want them put in stone in the city charter. They also want a new position called the Justice Director, who would essentially serve as a full-time policy analyst for city issues related to policing. 
They would have to submit reports ahead of key policy decisions and could not be a former cop. You can read more about what Prop A includes and its full language on our website, ksat.com. And once again, that was Garrett Berger reporting for us. Garrett also did a Q&A after his story yesterday where he talked about the police union's response to Prop A and what some of the sticking points for opponents of the site and release program are. You can watch that on ksat.com. A bill meant to legalize the use of fentanyl testing strips is moving through the state capitol this legislative session. Advocates across San Antonio are becoming more vocal in support of inexpensive test strips that could detect if a drug contains fentanyl. The CDC says fentanyl kills tens of thousands of people a year, and those strips are actually illegal in Texas right now. So we're waiting to see what lawmakers decide in Austin. It's very sad because they know that they could die every time they use. A hot zone map with data from December 2022 compiled by the San Antonio Fire Department shows the impact of overdoses is citywide. Corazon Ministry says reports from their clients tell them fentanyl laced drugs are in our community. A small amount of the synthetic opioid can be deadly. Many unsuspecting users have died from taking it. The House strongly supported House Bill 362 and now it goes to the Senate for a vote. Today is the 13th. That means you only have five days to file your taxes by the April 18th deadline. If you launched a side hustle last year or began freelancing, filing your taxes may present new challenges. Being your own boss can come with perks, but it also comes with a self-employment tax. The 15.3% self-employment tax includes your Social Security and Medicare taxes, and it's on top of federal and state income taxes. If you work for yourself, IRS spokesman Luis Garcia says consider paying your estimated tax taxes quarterly using a 1040 ES form. If you let it get bigger and bigger and build up to a huge bill, uh, that's where you run into trouble. Tax deductions like office supplies, the internet and phone bills are benefits for the self-employed, but they don't apply if you work remotely for a company. And avoid audit red flags like taking big deductions for meals, travel and entertainment, and be sure all deductions are backed up with well-documented receipts. Some positive economic news. U.S. annual inflation has fallen to the lowest level since May of 2021. A new report released yesterday found U.S. consumer prices are continuing to cool down. It shows consumer prices rose in March by 5% year over year, and that is down from 6% in February. And it marks the ninth straight month of slowing inflation. But economists say the real challenge for consumers is that the rate is still a long way away from the Federal Reserve's target which could signal more action from the Fed. That's why the debate around the Fed is about, well, how long time is it now going to take before we will get inflation all the way down to that 2% target? And the latest report is adding to the debate around what the Fed will do at their next meeting, either pause interest rate hikes or increase them to further cool down the overheated economy. Still ahead, why people in North Dakota are racing against Mother Nature to get 200,000 sandbags filled. Plus, Fiesta is just one week away. Why you may want to consider taking the bus to downtown this year instead of finding some parking for yourself. But first, the limits the Biden administration is proposing when it comes to auto pollution.